Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 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 There is a little attitude that I want to be mine. I found it in verse 6 of Acts chapter 9. In each decision that I face my whole day through, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 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 All you folk are doing well and I uh, hope that you're enjoying uh, your long weekend uh, thus far. You know, the Lord's blessed us with some uh, beautiful weather outside and I actually have a Sunday off uh, from, from preaching and uh, not preaching here in, uh, in Western Sydney. So uh, I thought I'd give you uh, something uh, from the scriptures, something that will be an encouragement, something that will uh, continue to, to help you uh, in your Christian lives uh, day by day. You know, we we find ourselves all in in, in a similar situation uh, at times, uh, and uh, what we're going to look at in, in this particular study here is no different. To be honest with you, uh, in talking uh, to you folk and 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 just uh, spending time with you, uh, I know that uh, you all have uh, family members or, or friends or, or neighbours or whoever it may be that do not know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, I, I know that there have been times where you have uh, talked to them. Or try to talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation and uh, maybe even times trying to talk about your testimony and how you got saved and how you came to know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and many of uh, your family members uh, friends have uh, kind of closed their ears off to that truth and um, uh, are not interested in hearing what you have to say and you know sometimes that can get discouraging that can become uh, disheartening and that can uh, cause us to, to be uh, concerned, you know, and what do we do in, in situations like that? Because we, we obviously love and, and care about these people uh, very much, uh, but we know that they're on the road to, to a devil's hell. And, and we know how simple salvation is. And we know that salvation is not found in a church. We know that salvation is not found in any particular uh, prophet or priest or, or, or pastor or whoever it may be, but salvation is, is simply found uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and Him alone. And how simple that is. You know, we, we've been through a, a previous uh, message before about what the Scriptures teach about uh, religion. And aren't you thankful that it, it is? It's, it's not found in, in a religious denomination. It's found in, in, in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet so many of our loved ones reject uh, that simple message that, uh, that simple truth. So I just want to try and encourage you from the scriptures in, in what we can do uh, when it comes to, to family members or, or friends that, that have just uh, uh, rejected or are not interested in what we have to say or what the scriptures have to say when it comes uh, to salvation. But firstly, can I just remind you of a few verses here in the scriptures? I just want to uh, remind you of a couple of verses which uh, uh, show us that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he died for, for all mankind. Okay, salvation is available uh, to each and every one of us. All right, it's not just for a select group of people. And firstly, you can get your scriptures ready. We'll go firstly to the Gospel of John, John chapter 4. And I understand the context here in John chapter 4 and doctrinally where it is in the scriptures. And uh, it primarily uh, focused here with the, with the nation of Israel and with the Jews. And I understand uh, all that when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ coming for a specific group of people, uh, which is the nation uh, of Israel and, and them rejecting their king. And there's a lot in the scriptures when it comes uh, to that. But just remember, as we've uh, mentioned before, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16, that all scripture you know, is given by inspiration of God. And we're told one of the reasons for it is instruction in righteousness. Right? So there's uh, plenty of practical uh, verses as well. And like I said, we'll take one here from this account here in John uh, chapter 4 and, and just remind us that salvation is open to all mankind you know it's uh, it's not just for Australians 
Right? It's not just uh, for us. Uh, salvation is not just uh, for us uh, living in this great land uh, down under. You know, salvation is uh, available to, to those in Poland. So here's my, my heritage here in this mug, and, and I am drinking water here in this mug. There's no other uh, liquid in there. You know, like I said, it's a beautiful day outside, and uh, the temperature has raised a little bit, and I love this time of the year. And to have some nice cold water is, is a real blessing indeed. Uh, but anyway, like I said, salvation open to all mankind. Those in America, South America, uh, Africa, uh, Asia, all around the world. It's not just uh, for a certain group of people. And I just want us to remind us uh, of that fact here in the scriptures. Look at uh, John chapter 4. And this is uh, an account here between the Lord Jesus Christ and a particular woman here in Samaria. And uh, the Lord finds his way into Samaria and knows that this woman is going to be at the well uh, drawing water. And there's a conversation that goes on between the two of them. And if we pick it up here in verse number 13, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Obviously, he's referring to the water here found in the well. Look what he says here in verse 14. He says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. So there's a, there's a different type of water that the Lord Jesus Christ is offering this particular woman. But I want you to notice the second word uh, in this verse. It says, Whosoever, whosoever. He says, But whosoever drinketh of the water. You know, there, there's no condition attached. Like I said, it's open to all mankind. He says, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. He says, But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And like I said, from a practical sense, a practical point of view here from this verse, the Lord Jesus Christ is referring to uh, salvation that he offers to whosoever. Uh, another passage in the scripture says, Whosoever will uh, may come, the scriptures say. Uh, go now to the book of Second Peter. Second Peter, that's uh, towards the end uh, of your Bible there. Second Peter uh, chapter 3. And another uh, verse just to uh, remind us uh, of this truth. Second Peter chapter 3 and look at verse number 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that, look at the next phrase, or look at the next word, he says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, that's, that's God's will. You know, it's God's will that there should be none that perish and that all should come to repentance. Salvation is open to all mankind. You know, that's, that's, that's God's desire. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came. That's the reason why he died. He was buried and he rose again for us, for all mankind. Okay, so there's another great promise there in the scriptures that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And let me give you one more uh, verse. Go back now to the book of Timothy. 1 Timothy and 1 Timothy chapter uh, chapter 2. The Apostle Paul speaking here to, to Timothy. And he says here in verse number 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, I exhort uh, therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for how many men? He says for, for all men. Notice it mentions a prayer there. We'll get into that uh, in this message a little later on, but this is just the context here in verse number 1. And he mentions the type of men there in, in verse number 2. But look what he says in verse 3. He says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our, God our Saviour. And then look what he says. He says, Who will have how many men to be saved? Some? No, it says, Who will have all men to be saved. You know, again, another great verse to show God's desire that's, uh, that all men uh, come to repentance, that all men uh, get saved, and that uh, this truth, salvation is open uh, to all of us, and it says not just to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth, and that comes takes place uh, after uh, salvation. So, look, those are just the three promises here uh, in the Scriptures when it comes uh, uh, to this fact that salvation is open uh, to all of us. Okay, whosoever will uh, may come. And I want you to see it, it's all on our part. You know, uh, the work's been done. You know, we, we've talked about that before. The, the work's been done. It's been complete by the Lord Jesus Christ there on the cross. And it's up to us to either accept uh, or reject. You know, we have a choice. The, the Lord's given each and every one of us a, a free will. And we can exercise that free will to accept that free gift. Or we can exercise our free will uh, to reject uh, uh, that free gift. 
But I notice here in verse number one, he's talking about this idea of prayer. The context uh, is here and uh, the idea that and, and gives us the promise there or the desire of God there that, that all men uh, are saved. So I want to give you some, some things uh, here in the scriptures that um, will, uh, will help us when it comes to how we can pray for those that, uh, that are unsaved. Uh, what specific prayer requests can we offer up unto God on behalf of those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as a Savior? And like I said, I know that many of you have uh, family members, friends, and like I said, neighbors, close ones, loved ones, uh, all sorts of uh, folk, children, grandchildren, maybe some of your great-grandchildren as well that do not know the Lord. Now, now how can you pray uh, effectively uh, for them when it comes to, to their salvation and for, for them uh, coming to, to, to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their own uh, personal Savior. All right, one thing that I do want to remind you of uh, before we look at these three things is the fact that, that we've seen God's will and God's desire here in the Scriptures, but we said that God's not going to override an ind individual's will. All right, but what we can do is we can, when we pray, we can remind God of these passages. You know, there's nothing wrong with uh, speaking God's Word back to Him. You know, in the scriptures, we're told that God has magnified his word above his name. So he's put his very words, that which we're holding here, that which we're reading here, above his holy name. That's how much God elevates his word. So there's nothing wrong with us just reminding God of his word. You know, when we say to God, look, God, we read in there that you're not slack concerning your promise. Uh, some men can slackness, but you're long suffering and not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. So I pray for this particular person. This person uh, comes to know you uh, as their saviour. You know, there's, there's an example there in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, and uh, there was a situation there with, with, with Moses and the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel, they, they corrupted themselves uh, with the things of, things of Egypt. And uh, the Lord got so angry uh, with, the, with the people that he said to Moses, look, I'm so angry with the people, I'm just going to wipe them out. I'm just going to destroy all of them and I'm going to start afresh with you, Moses, and then I'm going to start again with you and, and then we're going to move forward and just uh, just forget about this mess that the people have got themselves involved in. And uh, you know what Moses did? Moses went back to the Lord and said, look, you could do that, God. Uh, and again, I'm just paraphrasing here. You, you can read it there in, in the uh, early parts or middle parts maybe uh, of Exodus thereabouts. And uh, he, he goes back to God and says, God, look, if, if you do that, then, then what's going to happen is is, is the heathen, uh, the Egyptians and those other nations are, are going to say to you, is this the reason why you brought them out into the wilderness to, to destroy them? And then you know what Moses did? He, he, he reminded the Lord or he quoted God's word back to him. He, he, he quoted God's um, promise that he gave Abraham there in the book of Genesis, saying that he was going to make, make of them a, a great nation and, uh, and uh, make them uh, multiply uh, the seed and, and give them the land. And what Moses did was he, he, he quoted God's word back to God. And what did that do? That, that changed God's mind and said, okay, I'm not going to destroy the people. I'm going to continue to be uh, long-suffering and patient with them. So uh, I'm not telling us to, to be uh, proud in a sense when it comes to that or, or, or boasting or have an arrogant attitude, but we are told to boldly come to the throne of grace. That's the context of it by just uh, reminding God of what he's, he's written uh, in his word. And I'm, I know that, that delights uh, the Lord uh, to, to, to hear his word um, quoted back to him when, when it comes to a situation uh, like that. All right, so we'll look at these uh, three specific things that we can pray for when it comes to, to those that are unsaved and, and to those that uh, we love dearly uh, and those that are close to us that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's firstly go now to the book of Acts, and this is where we'll spend uh, most of this uh, message or this study in, uh, or whatever you want to call it, in Acts chapter uh, number 7 now. So the, the first thing in which we, we ought to pray concerning uh, those that are unsaved is that the seed uh, would cultivate, you know, that the seed would, 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 be, would cultivate uh, in their hearts. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, in the scriptures, the, uh, the, the word of God is likened unto a seed. So, so when that seed goes out, uh, when that word of God goes out of our lips that, and, and goes uh, into the ears and, and hearts of people who, who we talk to, we ought to pray that that seed would cultivate in their hearts, that that seed uh, would grow. But can I say, um, before it can grow, it, it firstly needs to be sown. 
Okay, so before the, the seed can, can grow in someone's heart, it needs to be sown. So we have a responsibility. As believers, we have a responsibility. And in Psalm 126 and verse 6, it reads this, He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed. Now, there's a key, key word uh, in, that fra- in, in that verse. He that goeth forth, it says, and weepeth. Now, I wonder when was the last time that, that we wept uh, when we were sowing the seed uh, of the gospel uh, to someone? You know, we're, we're told in the scriptures that uh, the Lord sees our tears and, and, he, and he bottles them up according to the, uh, the book of Psalms there. But how much power is there uh, in our tears? And if people see how genuine we are when, when we're talking to them uh, about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed. This is precious seed. These are the precious words uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to pray that the seed uh, uh, cultivates in that person's heart. And like I said, before it can grow, it firstly needs uh, to be sown. Now, how do we sow the seed? Well, we sow the seed through our words. All right, so look in Acts chapter 7 here. And I want to give you an example here of uh, this particular uh, preacher. And uh, this preacher's name is Stephen. So in uh, Acts chapter 6, there's a situation there where uh, he gets falsely accused of, of a few things. And he's brought before the authorities here in, in chapter 7. And uh, what we see here in, in chapter 7 is basically Stephen takes this opportunity to, to preach the word. And... As we won't look at the examples here uh, in the chapter, but you can you can run your uh, eyes uh, over the passages. And what he does is he, he gives a he gives a history of the nation of Israel uh, when they started there uh, with with, uh, with Abraham and then uh, with, with with Moses coming out of Egypt uh, into the wilderness and, and goes through uh, a great history uh, of the nation and examples uh, where they turn their back uh, on the Lord and, and all the way down. Uh, to, to, to Solomon there, uh, closer towards the end of the chapter. But if we if we pick it up, um, uh, well, before we pick it up in verse 54, he, he, he sums up his message, right? He sums up his message and, and, and points the people to the one in whom they crucified, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's described there in verse 52 as the just one, all right? And so he, he goes through that, he preaches a, a, a a great uh, convicting message to these people. And what is he doing? He's, he, he's sowing the seed. Okay, he's sowing the seed through how? Through his words. And that's, how we, that's what we ought to do as well. Look at verse 54. It says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Look at the response of these people. All right? the, the, as the word went out, it had an effect. Okay? The Lord was, was using that word in their hearts so much to the point, it says that they gnashed on him with their teeth. You know, these people were angry. They were angry with uh, what was being said uh, by Stephen. And no doubt there was conviction taking place. And as a result of this, we, we, we see their actions here in the following verses. And look what happens here in verse, uh, verse 57. It says, They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. You know, they came after the preacher. In verse 58, it says, And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Notice here that they cast him out of the city and, and they stoned Stephen for his message, for the message that he was preaching. They killed him. All right. And what a way to go. You know, he, he finished preaching his message and, and then this is the response uh, uh, of the people. But what I want you to, to notice here is that he's sowing the seed through his words. Right, he's sowing the seed through his words. And I want you to notice here in verse 58, the scriptures are very particular. Uh, and notice there's a particular uh, young man who's in the midst of all of this. And it says that uh, his name is called Saul. All right, His name is called Saul. And, and we'll get to this in a moment or two. So we see that we can sow the seed through our words. But at the same time, you know, we can sow the seed through our witness as well. What do I mean by that? Well, look at verses 59 to 60. It says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And look what it says in verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So not only can we sow the seed through our words, but we can sow the seed through our witness as well. 
In Stephen's example here, the words that were coming out of his lips were matching his witness and how important that is when it comes to us sowing the seed. Now we can talk as much as we want about the Bible. We can point as many people as we can to the Lord Jesus Christ and try and show them the way of salvation. But if our witness does not match the words that are coming out of our lips, it's not going to have any effect on, on someone's, someone's heart. Uh, the, 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 the seed's going to fall short. You know, we've got to make sure that what we're speaking with our words matches our witness, the way in which we live. And, and Stephen um, showed us how to do this here uh, in this example. He spoke the words and it matched his witness. How did it match his witness? Well, look what happens here in verses 59 and 60. You know, is he praying that God would strike these people down that have stoned him? No. Is he praying that God would come down and bring uh, vengeance upon them? No. Look what it says. He cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. What was Stephen doing? Well, he was just looking at the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when they hung the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross? What did the Lord Jesus Christ say? He said, Father, forgive them. And we see the exact same response here with Stephen. He had the same response as the Lord Jesus Christ. What he was saying with his mouth, what he was saying with his words matched his, his witness by the words that came out of his lips when he was dying. He's saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Lord, be merciful to them. Be, be long-suffering uh, with them. And I want you to notice that there was a young man who was standing at the feet of, of uh sorry there was this young man that was here in the presence uh, of Stephen when he was being stoned and his name was Saul he this man Saul he heard the words but not only did he hear the words he saw the witness of Stephen as well all right so firstly what i want us to to realize when we uh when we pray for those that uh, that are unsaved we ought to pray for the seed to cultivate in their hearts the seed being the word of God to cultivate, to grow in that individual's heart, right? And, and we said that before it can grow, it needs to be sown. We need to be willing to speak with our words, the words of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, point people to the Lord Jesus Christ through the scriptures, but we're going to make sure at the same time that, that our witness follows our words as well, that we're a shining witness just like Stephen was. So pray for that seed to cultivate. Can I say that that seed is not going to grow overnight, all right? It's going to take time. How much time? I don't know how much time. It depends on the particular individual. But while it begins to, when it's sown, and uh, in the meantime, we can begin to pray that it cultivates. And that's something we can pray for the unsaved. As a word's gone out, pray that that seed would grow in their hearts. You know, it does take time because look at Acts chapter 8 now. And... Um, Look at verse number one. All right, we've just, we just read there that Saul was present um, with what took place here with Stephen. And it says in verse number one, it says, Saul was consenting unto his death, that's Stephen's death. It says at that time there was great persecution against the church. In verse number two, it says that there were devout men that carried Stephen to his burial. Look at verse number three, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. All right, Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, if you're familiar with the scriptures, who, who wrote uh, the majority of, of, the, of the New Testament there, uh, Paul's epistles. All right, wanting to notice that he heard the words, he saw the witness of Stephen, but what did, did it have an effect on him? Look what effect it did have on him. He went out and started persecuting the church. All right, he went out and started uh, hailing uh, men and, and women and committing them to prison. Uh, the scripture said. So what, what I want to just encourage you in the fact that, look, when the word's gone out, uh, when, you, when your witness is, is matching your words, uh, when you're around family members that do not know the Lord, uh, friends or whoever it may be, just, just, just pray. Pray for that seed to cultivate because it's going to take time. It's taking time in the life of, of Saul here. Uh, go over to Acts chapter 9 now and uh, look at verse number 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. So still, okay, Saul is, is still trying to cause trouble uh, for these believers. 
It says, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. You know, he, he wanted to see them thrown into prison. All right. So we see here that uh, with uh, Saul, it takes time. It takes time for the seed uh, to cultivate. All right. So we can pray that the seed uh, cultivates in that individual person's uh, heart. Now, secondly, we ought to pray for the situation to change in their lives, for a situation to change in their lives. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, look at here in Acts chapter 9. We just read it here in verse number 2, but look what it says. Paul, Saul, sorry, he said he wanted to, he wanted a desire of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues. It says that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He wanted to bring the believers bound in chains unto Jerusalem. That's Acts chapter 9 and verse number 2. Look at verse chapter verse 26 here of the same chapter. A lot took place in between there and we won't go into it. We'll touch on it a little bit. But look at verse 26. It says, When Saul was come to Jerusalem, so he made it to Jerusalem now, says he essayed to adjoin himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, believed not that he was a disciple. Something changed. Something changed there in Saul's life. He wanted to go to Jerusalem to bring the, the believers bound unto Jerusalem in chains. But we read here in verse 26, he's ended up at Jerusalem now here, but he's not bringing them in chains. What is he doing? He's joining with the disciples. Something's taken place uh, in his journey there from Damascus uh, to Jerusalem. So what we ought to pray when it comes to family members, uh, friends that do not know the Lord, first, we ought to pray for the seed to cultivate in their hearts. But secondly, we ought to pray for, for the situation to change in their lives or for a situation to change in their lives. We see this happened in Saul's life. All right. So what can we pray for when it comes to a situation to change in their lives? Well, look at uh, verse number three and four in chapter nine. It says, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined right around about him a light from heaven. All right. It says, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So the first thing we ought to pray for when it comes to a, a situation to change in the individual's life is that there would be a falling. Okay, that there would be a, a falling uh, in their life. And look what it says here in verse number four. It says that, that Saul, it says that he fell to the earth. You know, he was brought right down. He was brought down to the dirt. He was brought down uh, off his uh, animal that he, he was riding. He was brought down as low as he could be. It says he fell uh, to the earth. All right, there needs to be some humility in that individual's person's life. Now, and the Lord can use situations in a person's life to, to bring them down, to bring some humility. Uh, it may come in, in, in all areas, okay? It could come in, in form of a, of a sickness or, or, a, or a difficulty, or it could come form in some uh, distress or some discouragement or some heartache. Or, the Lord can use, uh, use any of those things in, in someone's life and this is what he, he's done here in Paul's life. You know, he, he's brought him down. He's brought him down low. He's brought some humility to him, brought him down straight down into the dirt. He was high. Now he's been brought down low. And we can pray for that when it comes to, to those that do not know the Lord. We can pray that there'd be a falling uh, in their life. Not only a falling, but look at verse number six. It says, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will they have me to do? I want you to notice here in verse number six that, Saul is trembling and he is astonished. So not only should we pray that there, there's a falling, that the Lord would, would bring them low, that the Lord would bring them to a point uh, of maybe where there's a struggle in their life for whatever reason, uh, but at the same time, we ought to pray for the fear of God in their lives. We read here with Saul, it says that he was trembling and he was astonished. We ought to pray that the fear of God is found in this individual person's life. Now, the scriptures say in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It says, By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Now, if we've talked to people about the terrors of hell, if we've talked to them uh, uh, about the fact that one day they'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the great white throne and, and the Lord will, will cast them off into the lake of fire for all eternity and there's no way out, we ought to pray that uh, the Lord would use that, the Lord would put that fear in that person's heart, that they do not want to spend all eternity there, uh, separated from the Lord up there in the glories of heaven, but, but suffering 
and, and perishing there in the lake of fire. So we also pray for the situation to change in that person's life, that there's a falling, uh, that there's the fear of God. And then thirdly, that there is some frailty in their lives. Look at uh, verse number nine here of the same chapter. Again, talking about Saul, it says he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. No, Saul went through some frailty here where he had no sight for these three days. No, where he had absolutely no hope, where he had absolutely no no strength, um, no uh, understanding of what's going to happen uh, on the morrow, and uh, just uh, all hope was lost, and realized just how how, fle- how weak his his flesh was. You know, we ought to pray that for for these folk that we care about as well, that uh, there would be a situation uh, that would change in their lives, and in, when it comes to this situation, that there would be a falling that there would be uh, the fear of God found in their hearts, but there would be some frailty, that what they're holding on to, what they're trusting in, what they're hoping in, they would realize that it's just sinking sand. They would come to the point where, where all hope is lost. Uh, and before we move any further, can I say that this, this is a hard thing to pray. Now, this is a hard thing to pray when it comes, especially when it comes to someone who we care about so much, you know, because we, we have to be willing to, to let go and let God. Uh, and that's not always easy. Right, I'm sure you've experienced that uh, many times in your Christian lives before. We need to learn to let go and, uh, and, and, and let God. But we can still pray while God is allowing these things to take place in this individual person's life. Now, we can still pray for that, for that seed to cultivate. But as a result, as the situation changes in their life, that uh, we can pray that the seed would cultivate even so much more uh, in their life. You know, that they, they would begin to consider and begin to think about the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the gospel. All right. So we've said that we need to pray for the seed to cultivate. Secondly, we've said that uh, this, we ought to pray that the situation uh, changes uh, in their life. And when it comes to that, uh, we can pray uh, for, for a falling, that the Lord would bring some humility into their life, that, that they would bring them, bring them down to the earth like in Saul's example, that the fear of God would be found uh, in their hearts. And uh, at the same time, there would be found some, some frailty where they would consider what they're hoping in, what their strength is, and realize that it's all uh, empty and it's all vain. And then thirdly, we ought to pray that the scales are cleared from their eyes, that the scales are cleared from their eyes as a result of the Lord using that, that situational change in their lives. You now that, that they would then sit back and consider, not that all this has happened to them because they've been disobedient, but they would consider, well, 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 hang on a minute, maybe someone is closer to death because of the situation to change, and they'll begin to think, and maybe it, it will come to mind, that seed begins to cultivate. I remember when so-and-so talked to me about heaven, talk to me about hell. And then we can pray to this end that the scales will be cleared from their eyes. Look at uh, Acts chapter 9 and look at uh, verse uh, 17. It says, Ananias went his way, entered into this house, putting his hands uh, on Saul there in verse number 17. And then look what happened here in verse number 18. It says, Immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. You know, the scales were removed from, from Saul's eyes. You know, and, and where did this all take place? Where did this all begin? Remember, it happened there in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was preaching, when he was sowing the, the seed through his words, through his witness. And uh, as a result of that, uh, the, the seed uh, began to cultivate in, in Saul's life. There was a situation that changed uh, in Saul's life uh, as, as a result of him falling, as a result of the fear of God being in his heart as a result of his frailty. Now the scales have been cleared uh, from his eyes. And can I just encourage you in the fact that, remember, we're not the ones that, that open the eyes of anyone. Okay, it, what, what, Who opens the eyes of those that, uh, that are blind, spiritually blind? Psalm 146 and verse 8 says, The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. Now it's the Lord that opens the eyes. We can pray that the Lord would open a certain individual's eyes. No, as a seed begins to cultivate, as the situations change, that, that third prayer request is that the scales to be cleared uh, from their eyes. You know, can I just uh, encourage you uh, with these uh, prayer requests when it comes to praying for, for those family members and those friends that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ? And can I just say 
as well, that it may not just be uh, those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. There may be those that, uh, that may be deceived uh, by a particular uh, religion. You know, there, there are many out there uh, that, uh, that are saved, uh, but are yet just deceived uh, by a particular religion. You know, I know a particular person, and this particular person is, is deceived by a religious system. And this religious system is a, so it goes under the banner of a Christian religious system. All right? I'm not going to say what system it is, but I, I know someone who's involved in that. And you know, you can still you can pray for these things in this particular in this I pray for these things in this person's life. You know, the, like I said, that the seed would cultivate, that they would that 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 that, that truth from the scriptures, not from the religion which they're engulfed in, uh, would, would would grow and, and and would bear that fruit. That the situation would change. You know that that, that there would be a, a falling, or there would be a fear of God when it comes even to the judgment seat of Christ. That there would be a frailty. They would see that the, the foolishness of that uh, religion and come back to the scriptures, and then eventually the scales to be clear. Could even be someone who who used to walk with the Lord and no longer walks with the Lord. You know the, these three prayer requests can, can can encompass all of those situations. But uh, primarily, like I said, I'm, I'm just focusing it here when it comes to, to family members and friends that, that are unsaved and those in whom we, we witness to and yet those uh, still reject. So what are we all to do in the meantime? Pray, 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 pray. You may say, I'm, I've prayed for so many. Continue to pray, continue to pray. And then if, if they bring it up in conversation, then be ready to speak an answer. Be able to speak a, a word in due season as the Lord leads you. And in the meantime, just pray for these three things, that the seed gets uh, is cultivated in their hearts, for there to be a situation that may change in their lives and for the scales to be cleared. You know, as we finish up, to think about this, this idea here that I mentioned at the beginning, this all started with, with who? With Stephen, right? Through his words and, and through his witness, and Saul was present there. Stephen died, all right? Stephen died and, and went to his burial, and he never would have known. He probably would never even imagined what would have taken place after his death when it came to Saul. You know, Stephen never saw the results. Stephen was just faithful doing in what God had told him to do at that time. As a result of him sowing the seed there through his word and through his witness, that's where, that's where the starting point was for Saul. The seed was sown. It began to cultivate in his heart. And as a result of that, Saul got saved. Uh, we're told in the scriptures that he later became Paul. And like I said earlier, he wrote uh, the majority of the, of the New Testament. Look how the Lord used him. And look how the Lord uses him today uh, to, to encourage us through, through his words and for us to follow his example, as he says in the scriptures, that he followed uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So can I just encourage you in, in the fact that as we pray these three prayer requests, uh, for those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, we may not see the result in our lifetime. You know, we would love to. And I know I would love to, those in whom I'm praying for, but we may not see it. But what a joy it would be that uh, if uh, the, the Lord um, decided to, to, to take us out of here and, and to be present with Him and uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the Lord calls us up there and and then uh, that person who we've been praying for, that person appears at the judgment seat of Christ as well. And, and we never saw them get, get saved in our lifetime, but they got saved later on in life. You know, and, and that should be, that's what happened here with, with Saul. This is what happened with the example with Stephen and Saul here. So, so I, I, what I'm trying to get at and try and encourage you is don't give up on praying. You know, there's power in prayer, especially when it comes to an individual salvation. Remember we said it's, it's up to them. It's their free will, but we can we can remind the Lord of these verses, and we looked at just three of them to start off with. But at the same time, pray these prayer requests when it comes to these unsaved folk. You know, pray that the seed would cultivate. Uh, pray to to the end that there would be a situation to change, and that the scales to be cleared from their eyes. And again, can I encourage you in the fact that you know we we looked a little bit at Saul's testimony there. And we saw that he went out and about and just taking men and women, uh, Christians, and uh, taking them into prison and bounding them with chains and causing great, great havoc there uh, on the early church. And yet the Lord still saved him. Look how wicked he was. Yet the Lord still saved him when he came 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. So can I encourage you with that truth as well, meaning that it doesn't matter how wicked uh, someone may be. You know, we, we've said, whosoever will may come, the scriptures say. Don't let that discourage you in any way. If you're praying for someone, you say, well, God can't save so-and-so because they're just too wicked. And maybe you may think that they're too hard of a nut to crack. You know, that their, their heart is too hardened towards the gospel. And, and it well may be. It could well be hardened. But I don't think they're, they're going out doing what Saul did here. And yet, look at Saul's heart. His heart was, was broken. You know, his heart was broken and the Lord came in and, and put it back together and, and, and saved him in, in a glorious and miraculous way. So, so be encouraged by that testimony. Be encouraged in the fact that the Lord saved Saul. And if he saved Saul, he can save uh, anyone. So let me just leave you with those three uh, prayer requests when it comes to, to praying for those that, uh, that are unsaved, those uh, family members, uh, those friends, uh, whoever they may be. Firstly, let's just remember to pray for the seed to cultivate. Pray for that seed to cultivate. And we said before it can uh, grow, it needs to be sown. We need to be willing to speak with our words, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, show someone how to be saved. But at the same time, make sure that our witness matches up with our words because there's power. There's power when our witness matches up with our words. So pray for that seed to cultivate. Remember, it will take time. Now, how long? I don't know. All right, I do not know. I can't give you an answer for that, but just continue to pray. Pray that God would 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 use that seed. That's only, you know there's a verse in the scriptures that says that uh, God's word, which we've likened to the seed, uh, which the Bible likens it to the seed, it says God's word will not return unto him void. You know, it will accomplish that uh, where it goes out. So pray that it would cultivate in that individual's life. Secondly, pray for a situation to change in that person's life. You know, we, we saw that Saul was, was going from Damascus to Jerusalem for one specific purpose, and then the Lord changed that purpose. And the Lord changed that purpose in a miraculous way for him. How did he change that? Well, there was a, there was a falling in his life. Pray that the Lord would bring some humility into someone's life, that, that they would be brought down low, they'd be brought in a state where they realize, well, all hope is lost. Where do I turn to? Uh, help, pray that that Lord would, would do that in, in that certain individual. Pray that the fear of God would be found in that individual's life. We read there that Saul was astonished and he was trembling. Uh, pray that the fear of God, that the fear of uh, a devil's hell would be real to that individual. And then lastly, pray that there'd be some frailty. You know, that they would consider where their hope is, where they're strengthened and realize, like we said, that all it is is just sinking sand and they need to come to the rock a solid foundation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So pray for the seed to cultivate, uh, pray for a situation to change in their lives, and then thirdly, pray for the scales to be cleared uh, from their eyes. So can I encourage you just to pray for these three simple things when it comes to those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, those family members, uh, those friends, and just uh, be reminded of the fact that there's power in prayer. May the Lord bless you.
Stay. 